everybody. Um, welcome to another intake of Inside the Mind of the Artist, Inside the Mind of an Artist. I am with Brian C. O'Malley today, and I'm super excited to have him. He is going to talk with us about the importance and of collaboration. He, Brian C. O'Malley is a painter. He's a 2D animator interdisciplinary artist living in Greenville, Rhode Island. He has shown his 2D works nationally. Uh, he is a short film animator and he has um, shown internationally, which is, includes Russia, Chile, Canada, France, and more. His most recent film, Unsheltered, was screened at both the 2021 Flickers Festival in Rhode Island and an international film festival at Vancouver Island, the Short Film Festival, which is in Canada. Recently, Brian has turned his attention to independent curating, which include Rhode Island's independent animators and a show he curated called Digital Breath, video and sound in the age of global connectivity, which I was honored to be a part of, which was exhibited at the Newport Art Museum in Newport, Rhode Island. He is currently working on a sequel to Digital Breath entitled After the Exhale, which will be featured at the Southern Vermont Art Center Museum in 2022. Welcome, Brian. That was a mouthful. Thank you for having me. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot going on there for, for sure. The, all the, all the acronyms. Going. The acronyms kill you. So the first thing I want to talk about is you and I have known each other most of our lives, and we spent our summers on Lake Winnipesaukee on in, on Jolly Island at Camp Rocksmere, and. I don't know about you, but what I see, I don't know how you feel, but what I see in the, in the um, watching you all these years, and especially using the birch trees and some of the influences that I can only assume that you have growing up on a lake. I know that I was completely influenced by water. Um, boats show up in my work. We grew up around boats, especially canoes and rowboats that we spent time on. And just the isolation that we experienced, which at the time as a kid, I hated, but as an adult, I realized the richness and the quality of it. And I was wondering if you might want to open with that a little bit. Oh, for sure. And uh, I'm actually also at work on a project called The Island. Um, and it is certainly 100% uh, influenced by Jolly Island and the lake. And I was just there over the summer at Birch Island, which is across the way. And it was great to be there just three days of, you know, just immersing yourself into the wind, the water, the mountains. It's a really a magical place. So for sure, um, I think for me, the influence definitely came down to the physical materials I might have been using, um, you know, 20 years ago, 25 years ago. You know, always being interested in working with um, wood and especially birch bark, uh, bark specifically, and, you know, creating shapes. Uh, I did a lot of things on the wall years ago that were, you know, just rudimentary things like cutting a shape and then connecting it with, you know, marker, you know, the gouache, watercolor and creating these site specific temporary installations on walls. But for sure, I, and I think it's a collective thing too. It's always there. Uh, your ancestors are always there and we're collaborating with history. I was just gonna say, it's a collaboration yeah. with nature and collaborating with the epigenes of our DNA because yeah. both of us have ancestors that went back with Lake Winnipesaukee sure. as well. So I'm going to, before I open up some imagery, just, you know, you've been working a long time, but just to get an idea, you did your graduate work in Florida, correct? University of Miami, yep. University of Miami. And we're going to kind of go back and do how you moved from a very rich, almost neo-expressionism of painting 
and how you might define that for you when you were outside of graduate school and the paintings you made. And I'm going to show some of your influences and then we'll maybe talk about how you kind of moved into animation, which did that seem like a natural profession for you? Uh, it, you know what? Actually, it did, but it took a long time to get there in a sense. Um, early work was, you know, flat, a um, lot of caricaturing in a sense, simple line work. And at the time, I wasn't focused on that. I was focused on painting, flatness, you know, 2D things. Mm -hmm. um, and then when, when really, okay, Photoshop, let's go back. Photoshop 20 years ago was not the same. <laughs> so nobody introduced me to like the traditional, like, okay, hey, you do this on paper, you know, shoot it twice. And, and when Photoshop really became what it is, what we know today, that's when I was like, this is something I can accomplish and then all the other programs that go with it. But yeah, mind boggling. Did you get that in graduate school at all? What year did you graduate from my 19, 1999? I have a book from graduate school, Adobe Photoshop, like 4.0. So, I still have it. Well, I'm kind of Laughable. ignorant of the technology myself, but, but it was strictly painting. Did you feel that graduate school, um, was something that you recommend now to people who might be starting out? Because I know that you also teach. And yeah. do you think the university system is just as important as it was back then when you graduated? I, I think it is. Um, I mean, obviously it's an expensive adventure for students to embark on, um, but I think it's valuable, and especially if they can find the right fit mm -hmm. for what they're going to do. And that fit is really about, okay, your professor is who you're working with do they have something that you are attracted to? Like what, what, what kind of work comes out of that department? You know, what are they, what are they thinking about? How do they approach it? Is it multidisciplinary? Is it traditional or is it, you know, obviously combining many different things. So, you know, there are programs like Skowhegan, for example, you know, you could go to Skowhegan in Maine and yeah. And spend three months in Skowhegan and just completely, you know, transform your work. Or the Vermont art center, which I've talked about before is another sure. one. So did you did you decide on graduate school because of the instructors that were there and uh, did they have an interdisciplinary collaborative approach back then? They did not. <clears throat> no, not at all. Um, there was one professor who was sort of dabbling, you know, not the term mixed media, like he was dabbling with bringing um, video into his 2D work, but installation. And uh, no, so I, I, I purely was thinking painting, painting, that's it. And I, I got very much um, engrossed in doing a lot of sculpture, which led me towards installation work. And there was a few professors down there, one by the name of Tim Curtis, who was um, you know, known, he's a Midwest, you know, sort of um, artist who, you know, taught at different schools in the Midwest, but he did a lot of installation work and, um, you know, encouraged me to, to, to be open and invite many things, you know, right. into the dialogue. Yeah. So, yeah, so it was great. It was a great uh, experience. Yeah. When I went to graduate school, they made us choose either you're going to be in the painting department, the sculpture department, the printmaking department. You, you didn't get to do the interdisciplinary. And with that, I, I um, want to open up my screen and, and talk about, the, talk about, hello, my screen. And just go through some imagery that you were influenced by. Could you talk a little bit about what neo-expressionism is to you to begin with? Yeah, I'd, I'd go back to the uh, painters from the 80s and 90s, you know, Julian Schnabel being one of them. And he mm -hmm. now is a filmmaker, more known as a filmmaker. I don't even know if he's still painting. I mean, I haven't checked up on him. Um, but his films are really wonderful. And added and, turn and yeah, his film. Gate. So this is a, a Van Gogh influence piece. So his uh, last film was At Eternity's Gate. Willem Dafoe plays an amazing Vincent Van Gogh in that film. Um, and, and Vincent Van Gogh. Anyway, Here's the Vincent Van Gogh piece. Yeah. So the previous piece is an Adrian Genny. Um, uh, your previous interview, uh, I can't remember the name of the artist, my, my fault, uh, but she talked Krista a lot. Krista Harris, about, yes. Yeah, Krista Harris. So she talked a lot about uh, his work. Um, and he's, he's, he's pretty young. He, I think he was born in 1977 and, you know, he's really rocketed to, um, celebrity status as a painter, but, you know, this painting, obviously it directly influenced by Van Gogh and the neo-expressionists were 
completely influenced by Van Gogh and Cezanne. And you can see it in their brushwork, the, the boldness of the color, um, not concerned about uh, um, modalities of like you know, rendering a figure, more about expressing the figure and maybe the figure in turmoil inside a square or rectangle. Um, you know, this picture here, just the, you know, just to actually be in front of it, which I have not been in front of it, um, and I can see the way it was, per, you know, produced, like the slashing marks, the scraping, you know, we could think about Gerhard Richter as well. You know, another, you know, major influence on young painters or painters of any generation. Um, but I think, you know, also the, the use of color. Um, I think with Adrian Gany, there's, there's this, there's always a, a darkness that is pervasive and it might just be his little, you know, he's talking about something that's always there in the background. Um, and, and quite literally in this painting, you kind of see this really dark negative space. Sure. Um, Sure. Yeah, yeah. Where the Van Gogh piece, when he, I think uh, the actual painting, the sunflowers, from I believe 1888. Um, so there, you know, experts might talk more about you know the way he's putting the brush strokes down, um, sort of this psychologically charged way of painting, um, and the, the immediacy. Like he had to get a painting done. He was he had to get it out of him. Well, what's um, interesting is it looks so static next to Adrian's piece. And, it, and, and at the, it. it does to me. And at yeah. the time, at the time, it was like massive movement. Um, right. Yeah. Neo-expressionism uh, way before kind of taking abstract and figurative and moving them together. But um, this might have been considered a bit abstract for its time. Sure. No, no. Right. Exactly. Even I bet you a lot of artists were like, well, where's the drop shadow? Where's the shadow? You know, from the bots? <laughs> you know, how right. come how come all the all, every single bulb is painted the same sort of tone? Right. You know, but um, yeah, I mean, you know, I'm not going to say it's my favorite Van Gogh painting because it is not. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm really making the connection to, you know, Adrian Genny and his generation, neo-expressionism. And then obviously where I headed in my painting and still do this in my painting, you know, I can I can look at a Van Gogh self-portrait and go, oh, yeah, I, st I you know, I borrow his moves or I just make them my own, you know? Do we have a painting up? No, this is another, um, Adrian, um, we'll probably get to one of yours here in a moment. Um, the birch trees. Yeah, know? yeah. This is another one too that um, it has nothing to, I mean, it has everything to do with the connections, I think, between the work in a sense. Um, you know, I discovered this piece. Actually, I was talking to my students about using white in a painting. And, you know, it's not just your ground, like how do you effectively use white? And this, and this canvas, I mean, it's dominated by, you know, lighter values, um, low key sort of combinations. Um, but then the birch trees, that they had this magical power. Um, and in and, and this particular scene, uh, there's, you know, something's going on too. We have a, a crouched figure, uh, perhaps has some blood on his face or her face. Um, you know, maybe just an ambiguous gender figure. Sure, but, it looks like it looks like a figure with a beard. The yeah. use that pink on there is just fantastic, mm. which you don't see. You know, too much. Maybe some mixtures in the rest of the painting. So, mm -hmm. so it's a pretty fantastic painting. And th this brings me to: is this um, one of your earlier installation works? Yeah. So this is uh, 2010, and this comes. Um, uh, during a period where I was using no color, so it was only black and white. Um, and this this one is called The World According to Black and White. So this is just, you know, a portion of the gallery. So I have, you know, these tape drawings kind of leading you in, uh, leading up to this tower. Mm -hmm. um, and the tower, they're all five inch by five inch uh, ink drawings that uh, during that period, I was trying to work on four to six per day, news clippings. Some of them are just random, really just sort of... Um, intuitive drawings, um, some influenced by, uh, I didn't have a camera roll back then. <laughs> this is, this so, is just a great piece. Um, tell me about the figure off to the left that has um, almost something over their eyes. What is, what is the conceptual meaning behind this for you? Well, I, that also has, if we, um, there's not a really, a, a really good picture of it close up, but um, sort of what's happening there, you have a drawing you know, inside the head. So the figure doesn't need to see it. 
everything is inside the head. It doesn't need to see what's ahead, you know, in, you know, in front of the figure. And then we have this large, you know, sort of, um, you know, conical shape and at the top is a little figure. And then that sort of, that can go back to, I think the influence of uh, New Hampshire in the mountains and being kind of tucked in. Uh, Winnipesaukee is um, the, they called it, the, the natives called it, or the indigenous peoples called it, it's the smile of the great spirit. Um, and the, the, the tribe that actually occupied Winnipesaukee were Winnipesaukeeos. And they were part of the Abenakis and the Algonquin, the larger Algonquins. Um, but they would make everything, you know, by hand. And uh, I think they had conversations with the landscape. So. And it was the Ossipee Mountains. Yeah, it. yeah, yeah. So. Oh, yeah, that's, I mean, what, from, that's great. From, that. from Jolly, we had the Ossipees. From Birch Island, you could see on a good day, you could see Mount Washington. Mm -hmm. that's so, right. yeah. A little different so this view. particular piece is reminiscent to me of the uh, the photographer Annette Messager, whose whose husband is actually a more famous photographer, which I can't remember his name. Isn't that great? It's usually the other way around. Um, <laughs> maybe you might know who I'm thinking of or not. That's okay. Um, Annette Messager would use these these. Sir, she did one piece. She did these circulars. They weren't drawings. They were photographs of parts of the body and they would kind of move in space, but they were, who am I thinking of? It starts with a B. It will come to us at the end of the interview. Any closing comments on this piece before we go on, Brian? Just around the corner, you see a little, um, on this far wall to the right, you see a blue glow. That's one of my early video pieces. Um, and it's really, uh, the subject of the piece is just navigating through the landscape. So it's a very simple, minimal piece. Um, but one of the first things I did, like 09, uh, 2010, uh, not animated, live action piece. So just, you know, I was trying to combine things to see if I can get, uh, the energy and flow and the you know sort of me collaborating with myself with different modalities very good i love it i love this piece so and this brings us to 2021 right so this was part of in your film festival before i hit the button anything you want to say before i play it you know that was that, that was part of the newport art museum show so the title of this piece uh if it's not up on the screen uh it's called here and beyond requiem for 2020 so the digital breath exhibition in newport really for me was about what did breath mean as a metaphor during COVID, and what did it mean especially during you know the later 2019 into 2020 and then the whole of 2020 so um, all of us, you know, got, got our heads together and, and, you know, thought about what this really meant. Um, and we were forced into these digital compartments. And so this piece is sort of, it, it, it's a life cycle. So it's an homage to, you know, the, the birch tree represents life. The mushrooms, the polypores are important too. They're living off of the tree. And then the tree eventually turns into this energy beam and then eventually turns into a human head. Can I play it now? Let's play it. <laughs> Thank you. 
That's pretty powerful stuff. <laughs> yeah, the playback in the beginning was a little was a little wonky, but that's okay. It sounded it sounded like some strange breathing. <laughs> But uh, no, John Deval, um provided me with the audio and we kind of worked together on that and uh, did a wonderful job. And the uh, French horn for me is that transition, you know, as the, the tree is moving back and forth and you're seeing some live action video that's inside of the square, uh, the compartmentalization, you know, that we experienced uh, and still are experiencing to some degree, um, but especially during lockdown. But um, you know, that life, that life cycle plays out and essentially uh, here and beyond. You know, you're actually here, but you're beyond in a sense. And it's also a tribute to the people who were sick or who died during 2020, um, for the people who couldn't get the right proper, um, you know, care. So there's a lot of things. So it's definitely, it's a rumination on death, <clears throat> but in a way that's about rebirth. Um, there was a helicopter going by, so I muted myself. Just birch tree to human being, from mouth to human being or vibrational frequency. Could you talk really quick about how those three things transition beyond um, what you just explained? And maybe, maybe you did just explain it. I, I just was looking for the relationship of nature within that. Sure, sure. Um, I, I think for me, the, the birch tree has this symbolic power. So it was kind of a no brainer. Um, and also this was something that was lying around my studio. I was probably drawing it um, and I had it around for various reasons. So it made sense uh, to put it into this piece for sure, because in a sense, what's happening is there's a life cycle. So this tree has been pulled from nature. The, mm -hmm. the mushrooms are still surviving on the tree. These birch polypores, which are, you know, they are uh, medicinal mushrooms um, as many mushrooms are. And it, so the energy that is contained within that tree, you know, is also, you know, part of, of, life, of a life cycle and then sort of pushing it backwards and, and, you know, letting it go back to its original place, almost like a, it's, you know, decomposing. Um, but then the figure comes in, right? The figure comes in and the figure was, was really a, a reference and a nod to, you know, people who, who couldn't really speak for themselves during the pandemic. Uh, people who might have been on ventilators, people who, you know, who, who didn't have a voice. Mm -hmm. And so they might have been trying to speak what they wanted to say, but couldn't. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, just turning it into, you know, it, all human beings, like you have a rush of energy before you move on. And that sort of the head became that rush of energy. And then, it, then the head moved on, though. So the spirit moved on. Beautiful. Oh, thank yeah. you. Uh, before I get into this piece, I just, it, it hit me. Christian Boltanski is Annette Messengies. Um, oh, um, Christian Boltanski, yes. Who, oh, is, who is an installation, or I don't know if he's still alive, an installation photographic artist. Amazing work too, amazing work. So there you have it. Okay, yeah. so now, now we're more... I would say neo-expressionism in a sense, right? This is a 1993, and I think you pronounce it Arnaldo Ros Rebel. Am I correct? That's Rebel? pretty much right on. Yeah, okay. absolutely. What can you tell us about this influence of yours here? Yeah, well, I see it. Yeah, powerful piece, very powerful. Uh, large piece too. It's probably 83 inches square. Um, he does the frottage, you know, like Max Ernst at the bottom, you can see it, kind of pressing things into the paint, pulling them out. The he surrealist of, painter, Max Ernst. Yeah, Max Ernst, yeah, uh, we did a lot of frottage. Um, sort of, I mean, like just a fancy term for basically, you know, like taking something that would imprint into your paint and then kind of pulling it out, you know, mm -hmm. or even painting over it, letting it slightly dry and then pulling it off the canvas. Very um, but it's a really beautiful layer, but very powerful piece. This one's called the Spirit of the Colony. So for sure, Arnaldo Roche-Robel, and roche did not have a brown eye and a, and a blue eye. Um, he has brown eyes or he passed away in 2018. Um, but he's talking about, he was talking a little about colonization, Puerto Rico, a little bit, you know, the tropics. Um, and it's kind of interesting, like this painting, when I, I saw it in person, it's at the, the Rhode Island School of Design Museum. And I, I've gotten the chance to see it over the course of many years. And I saw it 
just before the pandemic hit. Hello. Um, and I was just, wow, like, you know, again, standing in front of it and really seeing it, the energy, the movement, um, you know, and Adrian Ganny, like think of that first slide we looked at and look at this, uh, there's a similarity there. So um, movement. Mm -hmm. yeah, just the, like you said, like, like the, the Van Gogh almost like static compared to the Genny and the, and the Roche Rabel where there's all this movement with the scraping. And he loves that yellow underpainting. And, and I can see then, you know, the influence of this movement in painting and, and Brian going, I need, I need more. I need to move into <laughs> animation. Okay. Yeah, that's, that, it, well, you think of painting too. It's, um, it's this is so one kinetic. Of yours. Yeah. It's so kinetic. And then, you know, it, there, there's thousands of moves that are contained within this square or rectangle or whatever shape you're working in. So it's like thermodynamics are, you know, sort of compressed into one. You call um, this an auto portrait. I did. That's the European way of saying <laughs> rather than call it just self-portrait, auto an portrait. An auto portrait, right. Max, Max Ernst would, would probably use that term, Verne Magritte. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, and those are the guys, I mean, uh, the painters who, are, you know, you study in art, in art school and you're like, oh, yeah, you know, Magritte more about, you know, semantics. And I think Max Ernst also just about visual language and, and um, all sorts of things, you know, just Magritte crazy. Meaning the symbol, more, more symbolism, where Max Ernst did do symbolism, but he sure. was pretty far out there, him and Leonore Carrington and and his wife later, oh, Kay Danley, Kay. They lived out in Arizona, um, me and my names today, but I, I just like letting people know out there like who these people are that Brian is talking about. Sure, yeah, and this one, this is a recent piece. So um, 2020, I didn't do a lot of painting. Um, I was really, I was really inside working on uh, collab, let's get back to the collaboration. So like, you know, collaborative yeah. pieces and, and it, there was a, a moment where I needed I needed to make a painting, and this was the one that you know I made during that moment. And I painted on top of an old painting. Uh, I really don't care, you know. I needed I needed that uh, square on wood, um, so I was able to scrape, sand, start a new painting, and I did a lot of crepe in the beginning, and I used a lot of oil sticks. And there's evidence there, you know, that's very tactile. Mm -hmm. um very van gogh like as well with the brush strokes and you know so the influences you know they're there they're all there absolutely very yeah good. yeah thanks so. for okay and whew, mm. another let's see from the temple el tempo para arnaldo, uh, arnaldo in memory of arnaldo roche rebel when he died when 2018. This is this is quite powerful, Brian. How, what's the size on this? Uh, it's just it's 48 by 48. Collaborating so. with those that have passed in the spirit world. Mm. Mm -hmm. And I and I did a, a not all Roche Rabel move. I did the yellow underpainting, and mm -hmm. and just let some of that come through. So there's a lot of scraping. Um, and I've also I've, I've really come I, when I'm painting and I'm using certain brushes. I use a lot of. Um, uh, solvent free gel and it makes the paint nice and transparent and it, it kind of leaves behind the mark and so it's the same lots of marks and lots of different you know different um, how do you use that solvent free gel i probably do about a uh, 70 30 ratio of sometimes okay. a little bit more i probably right, use more gel than i'm supposed to use but who cares you don't we don't have to follow the rules <laughs> yeah, no. there are guidelines there are no rules yeah like, it says on the package only use like you know a little yeah. bit like nah, 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 nah. let's just see how this goes <laughs> <laughs> okay so we are now um one of your influences mm -hmm. here the a fabulous installation artist Anne hamilton and i think you said you saw this show um it was uh, was it this is from mass mocha yes yeah yeah mm -hmm. so um yeah, this is going back quite a few years. This is 2003. They, they you know, commissioned a, an installation. And Mass Mocha, uh, for those of me, you have a wide audience, so you might have, you know, your middle of the country people, West Coast, but Mass Mocha is this basically giant, huge mill paper. It was a paper mill, but it's giant. This is just one building. There's so many of them. This is the biggest one, though. This is the largest structure um, that comprises this contemporary art museum in the upper left-hand corner of Massachusetts, right near Vermont. 
Mm-hmm. It's a great little, if anybody comes to the East Coast, and go to go to North Adams. That's the town it's located in. Hang out in Vermont. Just just a great place to be. This, this installation, I can still remember walking through the door and just the sound of the paper and the color. The color was like, was like, whoa, what just happened to my body? <laughs> um, yeah, and Anne Hamilton just touches on those very primal places. Mm-hmm. And, and that's sort of how she operates. These, um, these sort of bell-like structures, there's sounds coming out of them. Um, and there there's sounds of people, you know, about to speak, sort of speeches delayed. All the paper is blank. And she talks about how a piece of paper is like, you know, an invitation to write, to transcribe mm-hmm. something. Uh, but what I found in the space was that there was a whole bunch of paper uh, that particular day and people were kicking in, playing like they were playing in the fall and kicking leaves and the sound was wonderful. They were laughing. It was just a wonderful experience. So very multi-sensory experience. Um, and I always got, I've gotten that from her work. I've seen the work in Miami. Obviously I've seen it here. Uh, just amazing. Just uh, t- it touches those, those places that um, not a lot of work can. Mm-hmm. Yeah. She has a way, and so oftentimes she'll be in her own installations. Like I think of the worker collar blue shirts where she was, the pile kept getting bigger and bigger. And I think she was adding to them. And my, yeah. I, my memory, anyone Absolutely. who doesn't know her work, um, I I think we recommend look up Anne Hamilton. She's, Absolutely, yeah. She's so important to the repertoire of uh, collaborating with space spaces um yeah. she often finds big empty warehouses and they can feel very haunting as well um yeah you go to site specific places okay moving on we've got okay so we have here um say her name michelle M- michael uh, michael Rob- rovner Mikhail Rovner, yes. Mikhail Rovner, this yeah. is just one video still and we're gonna we're gonna actually also show um, do you want me to go to the movement? Yeah, oh, yeah absolutely. Is yeah. this piece called Frequency, by the way, the one I'm going to just show a little of? It, it is, yeah. Sounds like the volume is down. Can you hear it? Yep. Okay. Should I've kept going a little? Bit? No, it's okay. No, yeah. Sometimes buffering through to the to the Vimeo can can be a little challenging for sure. Yeah, Vimeo is is its own unique thing. <laughs> so and and Mikhail, oh boy, Mikhail Robin, another another you know interdisciplinary artist who I, I, I saw her many years ago, probably 15, 16 years ago. And it's like, I could, I could walk into that room right now. And it's, it's just, she touches those, like Anne Hamilton, a very primal place. They're very similar. They're contemporaries too. Mm-hmm. Um, in fact, th- this piece right here is um, giving me ideas <clears throat> for the next iteration of Digital Breath in which you're gonna be collaborating with me again. We're gonna be working together uh, for the show in Vermont. And um, in, in lieu of, you know, just like walking in and having a projection, she projects on her objects. So onto sculptural objects, you, as you can see the book, um, she makes these, because um, I'd call them this almost like uh, these um, crude urns and other, but, you know, ancient relics. And, you know, she puts her um, projections onto them. And this one, this particular slide is called, uh, I think it's called the Kraken Time. Mm-hmm. Where she's, yeah. where it's a large scale, isn't it? That she's yeah, doing yeah. So how? Give us a little hint. How are you thinking that this will influence the exhale for you? Uh, I think the simplicity of of the um, you know the animation because she's animating these characters and, the, and she's repeating them over and over and over again. Um, and there's this collectivity, like they're all 
stretched in, in a grid formation, let's say they're doing jumping jacks or, you know, they're waving. And if you go back, like your viewers at the end can go back and look at that uh, link to Vimeo. And if you continue to watch, like there's so many interesting and simple elements to her work that really touch on, you know, your collective memory, let's say uh, your collective on, you know, unconscious too. Um, like you feel like you're in a dream, you know, in her work. And it's just it really amazing, you know, um, but, you know, and, it, and it's so simple and straightforward. It's not, she's not entertaining people. She's making you think about what's happening here. What, what is, what's, what's where going is she on? from? Where is, where is she from? Israel. Israel. Okay. Yeah. So there you go. Old World erupts 2017. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so a friend owns this one, but uh, I always say to her, like, hmm, I need to come by and visit this painting. Yeah, um, yeah it, 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 this one, again, it's uh, the, the yellowish underpainting, and you could see the, the influence of very filamentous line where I scrape in and get these lines that move up. And, uh, you know, it, it, to me, as the painting was sort of finishing and almost finishing itself, uh, earlier I was listening to NPR and they were talking about um, the word flow. And somebody was asking the writer about, you know, do you ever experience flow? And, and she was honest. She said, well, not all the time. That's for sure. <laughs> Nobody does. Yeah. That. No, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody <laughs> wish. They always do. <laughs> yeah, right. But there was a particular day I was in the studio and I was experiencing the flow that nothing, I was in that moment where I was like. You were in the vortex. I, I was in the vortex. vortex. I know you know about that, Lauren. So, yeah. And so the, the painting kind of finished itself. And then, of course, what, you know, what we do, we back away and the rational brain comes out. and Oh, is it right? Is it working? Do I change this? And like I said to myself, you don't do anything in the middle. Leave it. That's sort of lower section of the bottom panel. It's a uh, uh, two pieces of wood. Um, and just, again, more of that very transparent brushwork in the middle with that Prussian blue. And yeah, so- it, What's and, the size? I don't see a size. So I've been working 48 by 48 because I can fit it in my car. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if I work any bigger than that, I can't fit it. <laughs> it. It makes me think of something coming up and being birthed from the core of the earth. Yeah. That's what I get from it. Absolutely. Beautiful, beautiful Absolutely. work. Okay, we have here, smaller image um i'll get ready to play this brian do you want to introduce this or well i'll introduce it brian yeah. came to me before um he was curating the breath exhibit and i had just finished this large scale i think it's it's 48 by 92 um a piece called i call forgiveness and it is they're like these pods of of almost hearts. I, I was thinking maybe beating hearts. Um, I like Brian was was um, thinking about the pandemic. I made that during that time. And Brian was saying, well, it's a digital show. Why don't we collaborate and do an animation piece? And I said, well, I don't know about animation. And Brian goes, I do. And so one night he calls me up and he's like, well, we, we, need, we need to start with some writing. And I'm like, okay, writing. And I just sent him something. And it was just, I wrote it on the cuff. And then he came back to me and he goes, now we need a recording. And I said, oh, I'll go into my closet and I'll do it now. So I went into my closet and I did this recording and it all just kind of flowed one of those flowing. And then, yeah. so this, we're, we're going to play this. And before we play it, you can add to it because this is the work of Brian with the animation and he did a fantastic job. And then John DeVault did the sound and it's, it's pretty amazing as well. Anything you want to add before I play it, play a clip? No, that's, that, that sums it up. And I, and I think obviously um, you're the author. I, I just, what, we were talking about collaboration and I, I really want to talk about that. So I, I thought it was really easy in a sense to collaborate with you. Uh, you know, we have a history together um, and, it, you know, I was like, okay, let's do this recording because the, the words you, you wrote were beautiful and you definitely had the flow going that day for sure. Um, and then all of a sudden we get the recording and, you know, maybe part of it wasn't good, but then you get this recording and you, you hit it. And um, so let, let's just play. Let's let the uh, piece yeah. stand for itself. And, um, and so the words I wrote were about breath, about our breath. 
So this was um, installed on a, how large was it installed on, on a wall? It, it projected on a wall, I mean, it was projected. Yeah, so it was projected um, about 120 by 72, that's HD ratio. Um, so it was a really big piece. Um, and in that space, we had a lot of audio, but I, there were some moments when your audio were, was peaking and then my piece which we watched earlier you know here and beyond you could hear the you know eh, so it was a really interesting uh, experience in the gallery mm -hmm. which to me felt like this cylinder you know you walk you didn't walk it wasn't a square gallery it was based on like newport architecture a cupola uh older architecture from the uh, 18th 19th century um but I mean, like, I, I, it was really easy. I, I, this piece, the reason why I chose this, it spoke to me about breath, like these pods were actually breathing, and maybe they were breathing underwater, they were breathing, you know, in, in, a, in, a, in the clouds. Um, and so I think, you know, working with the painting, as an animator, seeing elements that I loved, you know, painterly things, and you know, those little fireflies that are flickering in the background, and yeah, it was really fun. I mean, like, and that's part of what collaboration should be like, you should have some fun. If you're not, have then fun. don't do it. <laughs> yeah. And the Newport, the exhale will be, that will, it will be wonderful to set sail on. I'm going to do a large scale painting and, yeah. and it, it, it won't be animated. It will be its own piece. But right. so right. the challenge for me in the collaborative effort is making a painting breathe like like a holding the space of an exhale so we'll see what happens yeah absolutely yeah okay so we've got ah uh, and this this particular piece was this in the newport art museum show digital breath or was this for your film festival we're going to yeah, see no, a clip on this it is, this is a separate uh entity so this is unsheltered yeah. it's a film that i made over the course of uh, well, the pandemic, <laughs> March 14th, and I finished it about April 1st of 2021, uh, and specifically made not just for film festivals, but like screenings. So we've been screening in the uh, shorts program in, in the state of Rhode Island. Um, and this piece, um, it, you know, I can talk more about collaboration too. Uh, I've worked with a friend of mine, a good friend of mine, Joseph Fortune. Um, we used to work together, but, you know, we've been working on projects together for 10 years. Uh, maybe longer, 11 years, 12 years. And he always helps me out with sounds, voices that I need. Uh, so Joe is a part of this production. His son is the voice of the character, the main character, the protagonist. So let's just, let's just play it so we can talk about it after. But I know I have to keep moving and stay positive. Wherever I go, I look to see if there is any chance they could be there. So yeah, I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, so yeah, that piece, it, you know, it follows um, uh, the playback on the audio was a little spotty, but no, you know, we can put links at the end for all your uh, viewers who want to see it. So um, for sure. So I, I probably will release that film to Vimeo, like so everybody can see it soon. Um, it's making it's a lot of festivals this year. Unfortunately, they're postponing. They're online. It's not the same online. I want to meet other filmmakers. I want to talk to them. I want to talk to audio people and collaborate that there's, you know, so I want to, you know, so we can set up projects together. 
Um, you know, and I think um, that project, and then I was working on all these things at the same time. So not only uh, here and beyond, working on your, our production, Forgiveness, I was working on the film. I was working with, uh, you know, pure audio piece with Joseph and a few other people, John. And so I was, I, <laughs> my collaborative hands were all, <laughs> all over. And uh, I found it, you know what, I, I really was invigorated by it very invigorated, you know, and the only thing I, I would say that was a negative is I wasn't able to say, be in your studio and talk to you, go see John and be in his studio, go to Joseph, be in his studio, and, and really hang out face to face with the people I wanted to, you know, collaborate with, but we worked it out, you know, through Zoom calls, through phone calls, through you name it, right, Google Docs. Yeah, um, there's nothing like sitting in someone else's studio and just like oh, yeah. it back and taking it all in the little fragments and pieces that right. that's how things get born and collaborated. But we do, yeah. you know, we're, we're adaptable. Human beings are adaptable. So right. you're really moving on to um, a curatorial track, which is a whole nother realm of collaboration. Yeah. Sure, sure. And how how has that been for you? You know, with egos and uh, and 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 the, you know how it is with artists. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's a, that's a really good question because that I think ego. We've talked about this a little bit too in the past, where uh, collaboration isn't always easy. I mean, you know, you might have a partner, and sometimes just collaborating with your partner on dinner, <laughs> like I don't want zucchini. Get that out of here. Collaborating with my dog. <laughs> but um, collaborating, you know, it's, it's finding the right fit. So, you know, artists who I really have, you know, a simpatico with, uh, artists whose work obviously I admire and whose work would fit, you know, the concept of, let's say, a thing like Digital Breath or the Shorts program. Um, <clears throat> so there's so many things to consider. So, you know, we have, uh, you know, our, our team of artists for Digital Breath, we have Steven Subutnik. You know, he's a professor at RISD. He's an amazing, amazing uh, experimental filmmaker. Um, you know, we have a Daniel O'Neill, who I work with as a colleague at the Community College of Rhode Island. You know, he's very, he's very versatile. I know when I talk to Daniel, he's very analytical. He'll be like, so how many projectors do we have to work with? You know, he's going to ask me, where, where are all the three prong outlets? You know, how, <laughs> how, how dark is it in that one corner? You know, and that's, you know, so... These are people who are willing to work with the situation mm -hmm. and not expect that, you know, like, okay, I'm gonna, we're gonna cater to you. And, and the Newport Art Museum had a fantastic installation crew. They were amazing. Uh, Vermont, that's gonna be up to us. So we're gonna be collaborating on installation and working on putting the finishing touches um, at the museum. They're gonna help build things for us, but th this museum is sort of grassroots museum, mm -hmm. beautiful space beautiful location, uh, but their budget is such that like, okay, the artists, you know, come in with your work, we'll give you some money for a few things, but you install it because you're in control of the work that way too, you know? That's um, right. and, and, and there's another word too, control. Like, so for me personally, as a, um, as somebody who is doing curation, you know, there is a certain amount of control that I guess you have, but I, I would, I would look at it more like, you know, you're the, you're the conductor. You know, you're like, okay, here's here's what I'm seeing, but you know, here, what do you guys think? You know, so it's, it's what do you think as a collective? So we had a meeting recently, and everybody was more. The thoughts were more about because um, I was talking about allocating the space in Vermont, and you know, everybody said, you know what, we'll figure it out. Like, let's work with the space. Like, not just okay, here's your space, here's my space. It might work that I take a little corner over there and Daniel goes over there and Lauren has a big, you know, expanse of the wall and we keep, you know, projections away from it. Um, so yeah, there's, the, there's that sort of, there's a call and response in terms of what can we do as a collective unit to create this aura of after the exhale in this space, because that's coming. We haven't gotten there yet, but it's coming. So digital breath came together well. I was very happy with the results and, um, you know, it, there was a lot of things that made that happen because the artists came prepared, the museum staff was, was ready. Um, they, weren't re they weren't really prepared for the need for all of the electronic equipment, let's say, for example. Um, even though my, prop, my, you know, I proposed a digital breath exhibition, you know, new media, 
Um, but you know, they, they definitely were flexible and Francine Weiss is, she's the head curator there. Amazing. You know, just go with the flow type of, of a curator, you know, as a head curator there. Um, she does amazing work. So, um, yeah. Hats off so I, I look forward to watching, you know, the next 10 years of your trajectory of how <laughs> you're going to move this, your work with the collaborative work with more curatorial. It's yep. exciting. It's very yep. exciting, Brian. Yes. Yeah. I'm excited for the new film too. So uh, you're going to be one of my voices, Mrs. King Bear. Yeah, <laughs> Mrs. King Bear. <laughs> From well, Lake Pasaki, uh, the King Camp. Yes, yep, I yep. remember them. That's I don't right. remember Mrs. Well, King's voice. But Mrs. Mrs. King Bear in the, the new narrative, Mrs. King Bear, you know, like I'm saying right at the beginning of the film, the uh, portions of this film are based on true events. And this, this uh -huh. is, so I have four characters. All of them have some kind of, they had trauma in their lives. Mrs. King Bear has ovarian cancer. Oh. And she, she's sitting, so we were introduced to Mrs. King Bear. She's typing. She's in New York City. She's typing, or, or a city. And she all of a sudden stops typing and you see a tear roll down her eye. That's where the voice comes in. You know, she's typing about ever since I was diagnosed with ovarian cancer, I can't find the flow. Oh, this is going to be, this will be um, <laughs> enriching. It will be enriching. And it's oh, yeah. Enriching. oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And this sure. interview has so. been an honor. Is there anything you would like to add to the audience to give some advice on? those that are embarking on interdisciplinary um, works or how to start incorporating interdisciplinary works and collaboration in general, how sure. they might go about finding collaboration out there if they had a desire to do so, but did, didn't have any idea where to start. Hmm. That's, I mean, that's a pretty, uh, for sure. I know that was extensive. <laughs> Uh, the, the first Maybe thing that yeah. <laughs> the first thing I thought of is like just like when you, when you're with I'm sure you get the same recommendation you're paying students don't worry about making mistakes you know because with the computer you have command Z <laughs> you have undo 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 um, and you can just scrap a project start new you know with your you know content uh, you know is talk to people maybe talk to a photographer that you know um maybe start a start a mini project a, a short project with somebody that you feel comfortable with um and then see where that gets you um and it, it could be a, a combination of that person's photography your painting and some audio um and keep it simple to start and then once you grow your skills uh then you can expand and think about okay the next show you have instead of it all just being paintings you're going to have a, a projected painting and what would that be like sit down and think about that for a second you know, like look at Mikhail Robner's work, you know, look, um, Anne Hamilton's more installation with Mikhail Robner, to me feels like they're, these paintings are just coming to life. They're moving, crawling, you know, doing their thing. Um, even we haven't talked about, I mean, I didn't put them in the slide deck, Matthew Ritchie, another one, you know, like he does these amazing installations. He also showed his work at Mass Mocha in, um, in Massachusetts. Um, I think he's got a studio in New York. That's why he, he shows his work in Boston. He shows his work um, in the area. Uh, you know, near me, not too far from me. So, um, so yeah, I mean, and then find some commonalities. Like if you look at the work of these other artists, like, you know, they have a lot of helpers. <laughs> so, okay, what portion of their work could I say, okay, I, I like what's going on here. How can I make that my own? You know, how can I bring it to my world? So, you know, Mikhail Robner reminds me of when I was just a wee little lad playing Space Invaders, you know, and it's like, simple simple computer graphics you know like doo, 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 doo. even the sounds too like just simple simple stuff so do so, you yeah. find like the work of uh bill viola to be of a big influence who we who i tend to think of as sort of the granddaddy of um of video work becoming uh, of its own i'm just curious like if you had someone i know he wrote a book or, or the, and and I wonder if that might be a reference material for those that are out there wanting to do more to see how videography or video installation has worked. Do you have somebody else like Kent? Kent. Um, William Kentridge. William yes, Kentridge. William, yes. William Kentridge for sure. Yeah. Um, William Kentridge will even is, is a basically self admittedly he said I wasn't a great painter so I kind of stuck with he's, he's amazing with charcoal drawings and uh, his his uh, installations are just amazing so he uh, installed some work at the ICA in Boston 
that I saw about five years ago. Um, but I think I think um, Bill Viola for sure. But you, you know what? The best place to start? Go right to Vimeo. Go right to oh, Vimeo. Very good. Very good. Thank um, you. And then I, honestly, I I look at the staff picks a lot. Now they're going to be conservative in their picks, but you're going to find something interesting. And then just go deeper, dig in, like experimental animators. So like Jules Engel is an experimental animator, California um, professor, you know, probably uh, more mid 20th century. Um, okay. I look, you know, I look at so another person I might uh, look to in the past, Maya Darren, early, you know, female feminist. Oh, woman. yes. Puerto Rico. Yeah, yeah. From Puerto Rico. Uh, Marjorie yeah. Keller, former professor of mine, um, another one, early feminist, well, not early, but like, you know, 80s feminism, 90s feminism. Mm -hmm. um, you know, experimental filmmakers, you know, who are really kind of pushing the boundaries of narrative and also bringing in their own personal, um, you know, sort of, um, you know. Or don't look at anything and just start taking your iPhone out and doing stuff. I know. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. That, you know, absolutely. Sometimes with that studio practice is a closed door. So. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I was, um, I wasn't going to hold the interview here, but this is just a room and I have all my electronic equipment all around me. So I have, you know, my camera, my my projectors. I've got all sorts of stuff. I and I go out to my painting studio to shoot stop motion. Let's say, you know, I, over here I have a big mess, but you know, speakers and all things that I need, like scanners, um, things that you need. And of course, this is so handy to have. Obviously, you know, quick on the go stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah. So many so amazing apps. Yeah. Um, this has been a pleasure, and what we will um, put links down at the um, yeah. at the bottom when this is done. And I just, Brian, I just want to thank you so much. And for all of you, it's our second take of Inside the Mind of an Artist, and we will be doing we'll be doing more. Um, I, yeah, Zoom. So Brian, I want to thank you so much for participating and I look forward to collaborating with you more. And um, yeah, cool. good. Well, I, I thank you for having me and it was great uh, talk. And I thought, you know, the images flowed nice and Christian Boltanski, boy, he just came out of, you know, left field. Christian Boltanski, <laughs> yeah, we haven't thought about of him in a while. I know. I want to look up his work. Like as soon as we're done, I'm like, Christian Boltanski, what's he working on? You know, uh, but you know, I think that's also part of like you know uh, this contemporary world we live in. We we had all these things in the '90s and you know, and in early 2000s, and now we're just we get bombarded, so we forget about people sometimes. And he's yeah. important. He's an important. Yeah. Artist, so. But thank, thank you for having you. me, though. Okay. Bye. Bye. <laughs>